Before I start this story, I just want you to know that it's for educational purpose and I mean no disrespect to anyone that I talk about in this case and I upload once or twice a week. Scott was born October 24, 1972, in San Diego, California, to Lee Arthur Peterson, who owned a crate packaging company, and Jacqueline also known as Jackie Helen Latham who owned a boutique in La Jolla called The Put On. Lee and Jackie had six children from previous relationships. Scott was their only child together. As a child, Scott shared a bedroom with his half-brother John in the family's two-bedroom apartment in La Jolla. He began playing golf at an early age, and, by age 14, he could beat his father at the game. For a time, Scott had dreams of becoming a professional golfer, and he was teammates with future pro Phil Mickelson at the University of San Diego High School. By the end of high school, he was one of the top junior golfers in San Diego. In 1990, Scott enrolled at Arizona State University, where Mickelson had also enrolled, on a partial golf scholarship. Scott's father, Lee, later testified that Scott was discouraged by the considerable competition that Mickelson and an unnamed future pro presented. According to Chip Couch, the father of another young golfer, Chris Couch, Scott was taken off the golf team after Chip discovered that Scott had taken his son out drinking while Chris was visiting Arizona State for a recruiting trip. Chip complained to the Arizona State golf coach, who subsequently kicked Scott off the team. Scott transferred to Cuesta College and then to California Polytechnic State University. Initially planning to major in international business, Scott ultimately graduated with a degree in agricultural business. Professors who taught Scott described him as a model student. Lacey was born May 4, 1975, to Sharon Anderson and Dennis Robert Rocha, who had met in high school and owned a dairy farm west of Escalon, California. Lacey's older brother, Brent Rocha, was born in 1971. Lacey worked on the farm from a young age and also enjoyed gardening with her mother. Sharon and Dennis divorced when Lacey and her brother were young. Sharon and the children moved to Modesto, though the children visited the dairy farm on weekends. Sharon eventually married Ron Gransky, who helped raise Lacey and Brent from the time Lacey was two years old. Lacey was a cheerleader in junior high and high school. After graduating from Thomas Downey High School, she attended California Polytechnic State University, majoring in ornamental horticulture. While at Cal Poly, Scott worked at Pacific Cafe, a restaurant in Morro Bay. Lacey would occasionally visit the restaurant to see a friend who also worked there. In mid-1994, Lacey sent Scott her phone number, she also told her mother that she had met the man that she would marry. Scott later called Lacey, and they began dating. As the relationship grew more serious, Scott put aside his dreams of professional golf in order to focus on a business career. The couple dated for two years and eventually moved in together. In 1997, after Lacey graduated, they married at Sycamore Mineral Springs Resort. While Scott finished his senior year, Lacey took a job in nearby Prundale. Prosecutors later stated that, around this time, Scott engaged in his first extramarital affair, though they did not reveal the details of the relationship. Scott graduated with a Bachelor of Science degree in Agricultural Business in June 1998, and the Petersons opened a sports bar in San Luis Obispo called The Shack. The Petersons decided to put the shack up for sale when they moved to Lacey's hometown of Modesto, California to start a family. They completed the sale in April 2001. In October 2000, the Petersons purchased a three-bedroom, two-bath bungalow house for $177,000 on Covina Avenue in an upscale neighborhood near East La Loma Park. Lacey took a part-time job as a substitute teacher, and Scott got a job with Tradecorp USA a newly founded subsidiary of a European fertilizer company, for which he earned a salary of $5,000 a month before taxes. Lacey's family, including her mother and younger sister, related that she devoted much of her energy towards being the perfect housewife, and that she enjoyed cooking, entertaining and watching Martha Stewart. In 2002, Lacey discovered she was pregnant, her due date was February 10, 2003. The couple had planned to name their son Connor. In November 2002, Scott was introduced by a friend to Amber Fry, a Fresno massage therapist, and the two began a romantic relationship. On December 23, 2002, 
At 5.45 p.m. Lacey and Scott went to Salon Salon, the workplace of Lacey's sister Amy Rocha, where Amy cut Scott's hair, as she did each month. Scott offered to pick up a fruit basket that Amy had ordered because he would be playing golf the next day at a course near the retailer. Prosecutors say Scott also told other people he would play golf on the day of Christmas Eve. Lacey's mother, Sharon, spoke with Lacey on the telephone around 8.30 that evening. The last three people known to have spoken to Lacey before she disappeared were Amy, Sharon, and Scott. Scott later told police that he last saw his wife about 9.30 a.m. on December 24, when he left to go fishing at the Berkeley Marina. He said Lacey was watching a Martha Stewart show about meringue and preparing to mop the floor, bake cookies, and walk the family dog to a nearby park. Karen Servas, a neighbor of the Petersons, stated that she found the Peterson's dog, a golden retriever named Mackenzie, alone outside the home and returned him to the Peterson's backyard at around 10.30 a.m. She later testified that she had found the dog at 10.18. Another neighbor, Mike Chiavetta, said he saw Mackenzie at about 10.45 a.m. as he played catch with his own dog. The Modesto Bee also reported an unnamed female neighbor found the dog with muddy leash, wandering in the neighborhood. That neighbor put the dog in the Peterson's yard, not observing that anything was out of place. At 2.15 p.m., Scott left a message for Lacey, stating, Hey, beautiful. It's 2.15. I'm leaving Berkeley. Scott said he returned home that afternoon finding Lacey's car in the driveway and the house empty. He also stated that he found Mackenzie in their backyard, and that he related this to Lacey's mother. Sharon, though Sharon later denied this in her book. Scott showered and washed his clothes. A neighbor of Scott's later said that Scott had knocked on his door, asking if he had seen Lacey. The neighbor and his wife both testified overhearing Scott, saying that he had been golfing that day and had tried to call Lacey. A relative of Lacey's would also later testify that, when friends and family began gathering at the Peterson home that night, Scott said he had gone to play golf. Scott called his mother-in-law, Sharon, to ask if Lacey was with her. Sharon subsequently said that call was when she learned Lacey was missing. Scott and Lacey's stepfather both reported Lacey missing. The police received the report of her disappearance shortly before 6 p.m. At the time of her disappearance, Lacey was seven and a half months pregnant, with a due date of February 10, 2003. The story attracted nationwide media interest. Modesto police detectives and the lead investigators on the case responded to the missing person call. When they arrived at the Peterson home, Lacey's keys, wallet, and sunglasses were found in her purse in a closet. The detective told ABC News in 2017, I suspected Scott when I first met him. Didn't mean he did it, but I was a little bit thrown off by his calm, cool demeanor and his lack of questioning he wasn't, will you call me back? Can I have one of your cards? What are you guys doing now? The detective further described Scott's behavior as a strange combination of polite and arrogant, disaffectedly distant and impatiently irritable. He just didn't seem like a man who was crushed or even greatly disturbed by his wife's disappearance and possible death. After Scott told the police that he had gone to fish for sturgeon at the Berkeley Marina, about 90 miles from the couple's Modesto home, detectives launched a search. Though police later said they suspected foul play almost immediately, they did not treat the case as suspicious within the first few hours after the missing persons report was filed. During this period, Scott's in-laws defended him and portrayed him and Lacey as the ideal couple, and public perception of Scott reflected this. As police continued to investigate, they grew more suspicious of Scott. On January 17, 2003, it became known that Scott had engaged in two other extramarital affairs prior to an affair with a woman named Amber Fry. Fry informed police of their relationship on December 30, 2002, shortly after discovering he was a person of interest in Lacey's disappearance. She told detectives that she met Scott on November 20 and that he had initially told her he was single. She also informed police that on December 9, two weeks before Lacey's disappearance, Scott had told her that he was a widower and it would be the first Christmas without his wife. Police considered whether this was an indication that Scott had already decided to kill Lacey. Fry agreed to phone him while police recorded her subsequent phone conversations with Scott in the hopes of getting him to confess. 
On January 15, 2003, police told Lacey's immediate family that Scott had been having an affair and showed Sharon and Ron a photo of Scott with Amber. Sharon indicated at this point that she believed Scott had killed Lacey. On January 24, Sharon, Ron and Lacey's brother, Brent, told reporters that they were withdrawing their support from Scott, though Scott had not officially been named as a suspect. Hours later, Amber Fry held a press conference, in which she explained her role in the investigation. Ron Gransky would later testify that they did this upon learning of his affair with Fry, in particular upon seeing photos of the two of them together. A month after Lacey's disappearance, her brother, Brett Rocha, stated at a press conference that Scott had admitted to him during a January 16, 2003, phone conversation that he had been having an affair with a woman from Fresno at the time, though Brent added that Scott was now no longer communicating with the Rocha family. Modesto police and firefighters carried out an extensive search along Dry Creek the day after Lacey's disappearance. The search came to include helicopters equipped with searchlights, police mounted on horseback and bicycles, canine units, and water rescue units on rafts. A total of 30 officers were involved in the search, as well as Lacey's loved ones and volunteers, who posted flyers to raise awareness of her disappearance. At a press conference, a detective said that police did not believe that Lacey decided to leave without contacting her family, commenting, that is completely out of character for her. The initial search and later vigil were organized by Lacey's immediate family and friends. In the first two days, up to 900 people were involved in looking for Lacey, before community officials or police directly participated in the search, and prior to significant media coverage. Eventually, the story attracted nationwide media interest. A $25,000 reward was offered later increased to $250,000 and, finally, to $500,000 for any information leading to Lacey's safe return. Posters, blue and yellow ribbons, and flyers were circulated, and the original, basic version of the LaceyPeterson.com website was launched by the husband of one of her friends. Friends, family, and volunteers set up a command center at a nearby Red Lion Hotel to record developments and circulate information. Over 1,500 volunteers signed up to distribute information and to help search for her. On April 13, 2003, a couple walking their dog found the decomposing body of a full-term male infant in a marshy area of the San Francisco Bay Shore in Richmond's Point Isabel Regional Shoreline Park. On April 24, ABC News report stated his umbilical cord was still attached, and the San Francisco Chronicle reported that it appeared torn, rather than cut or clamped as is the normal practice following birth. However, ABC News later reported on May 30 that, according to the autopsy, neither the umbilical cord nor the placenta were found with the body. One day later, a passerby found the body of a recently pregnant woman washed up on the eastern, rocky shoreline of the bay, one mile away from where the baby's body was found. The corpse was decomposed to the point of being almost unrecognizable as a human body. The body was missing the head and arms, and most of the legs. On April 18, 2003, the results of DNA tests verified that they were the bodies of Lacey and her unborn son. The fetus's skin was not decomposed at all, though the right side of his body was mutilated. Although a judge sealed the autopsy results, an anonymous Associated Press source revealed that 1.5 loops of nylon tape were found around the fetus's neck and a significant cut was on the fetus's body. The exact date and cause of Lacey's death were never determined. Her cervix was intact. She had suffered two cracked ribs, but the pathologist could not determine if this occurred before or after her death. Lacey's upper torso had been emptied of internal organs except for the uterus, which protected the fetus, explaining the lower level of decomposition he experienced. The pathologist concluded that the fetus had died in utero, and determined he had been expelled from Lacey's decaying body, though when cross-examined in court, he conceded that he could not determine whether he had been born alive when this occurred. The pathologist also found meconium in Connor's bowels, which is the first stool passed after birth. The discovery of the bodies created a greater sense of urgency for the detectives who had put a tracker on Scott's car. Knowing that he was in San Diego at the time, they feared he would escape across the border to Mexico. One of the detectives commented in 2017, I just thought, we've got to find Scott right now. 
he told me he was there and that's where the bodies come up? I mean, I believe it was premeditated, he planned it. San Diego was pretty darn close to the Mexican border. Scott knew the area pretty well. That's where his parents lived. That's where he lived, so it wasn't like he was going to have to get on MapQuest to try and figure out a way to get to Tijuana. The FBI and Modesto Police Department performed forensic searches of the Peterson home. The FBI also conducted mitochondrial DNA testing on a hair from pliers found in Scott's fishing boat that linked them with hairs recovered from Lacey's hairbrush. The authorities also searched Scott's pickup truck, toolbox, warehouse, and boat. A homemade anchor was found in the boat that Scott had purchased two weeks earlier. Scott told a detective that he made the anchor for the boat using a 90-pound bag of concrete and used the rest of the bag to repair his driveway. Detective Henry Dodge Hendy testified that he found a cement-like substance on the wooden bed of a boat trailer when he searched Scott's warehouse on December 27. Detective Hendy pointed to what he said were five circular areas on the trailer that had less powder than other areas on the trailer. He also found a dustpan surrounded by the white powder and a sledgehammer. Prosecutors believed that Scott made five anchors and used four of them to sink Lacey's body in San Francisco Bay. After Scott was arrested, police conducted further searches in the bay in an attempt to locate the anchors, but nothing was found. Scott was arrested on April 18, 2003, near a La Jolla golf course, where he said he was meeting his father and brother for a game of golf. His naturally dark brown hair had been dyed blonde, and his Mercedes was overstuffed with miscellaneous items, including nearly US$15,000 in cash, 12 Viagra tablets, survival gear, camping equipment, several changes of clothes, four cell phones, and two driver's licenses, his and his brother's. Scott's father, Lee Peterson, explained that Scott had used his brother's license the day before to get a San Diego resident discount at the golf course, and that Scott had been living out of his car because of the media attention. Police and prosecutors, however, saw these items as an indication that Scott had planned to flee to Mexico. So he arrested and taken in waiting for his trial, June 1, 2004, trial starts and it's a long one. So Scott's team was focusing on police and how they handled the whole case saying that there was really no proof that Scott was the one who did this. No fingerprints, no DNA. The whole case against Scott was that he was having an affair and they found a strand of hair in his pliers. They also tried to push narrative that Lacey was most likely killed by a satanic cult because she was missing all of her limbs. Also, they focus on the fact that the diver searched the bay 15 times and found nothing, making them believe that she was placed there later on with Scott being trapped or followed everywhere there was no chance for him to place the body in the bay without anyone seeing him and they were standing by the fact that there wasn't any physical evidence saying that Scott did this for sure, without a doubt. A forensic expert testified about the pliers with the hair strand in it, so prosecutors say that the hair most likely belonged to Lacey. But DNA couldn't fully prove that the hair belonged to Lacey because there was no root at the strand. A criminalist for the State Department of Justice justified that the test she conducted on the pliers showed that the pliers had been used recently to cut anything. The forensic expert also testified that she saw no signs of blood or human tissue on the pliers. Scott's defense lawyers theorized that someone kidnapped Lacey held her hostage until she gave birth and then dumped both bodies in the bay. The reason that they think this is because Scott was not home when Lacey was spotted walking the dog, there were 11 different witnesses in the neighborhood who saw Lacey walking the dog that morning and police only questioned three of those witnesses. Amber Fry ends up testifying in court, she tells them everything. Jurors listen to the recordings of Scott and Amber's phone conversations, which just proved that she was telling the truth and that Scott was the liar. The prosecution presented Scott's fair financial problems and fatherhood as motives for murdering. He killed Lacey due to his increasing debt and a desire to be single again. On November 12, 2004, the jury convicted Scott of two counts of murder. First-degree murder for killing Lacey and second-degree murder for killing their baby. So the judge, followed the jury's verdict sentencing Scott to death by lethal injection, calling the murder of Lacey cruel and heartless. So, Scott's attorney filed a 423-page appeal of Scott's sentence, 
which he stated that the publicity surrounding the trial and other mistakes deprived Scott of a fair trial. On August 24, 2020, Supreme Court of California upheld Scott's conviction but overturned his death sentence because Scott's trial judge had dismissed jurors who opposed capital punishment without asking them whether they could put their views aside. Supreme Court rulings say that jurors may not be excused, merely for opposition to the death penalty. Prosecutors initially stated that they would retry the penalty phase, but subsequently reversed that decision in June 2021. On September 22, 2021, California Superior Court ruled that Scott would be resentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. And this is all I have for this case. Thank you so much for watching, and if you enjoyed, please subscribe and leave a thumbs up down below, and thanks for watching once again.